Hi, everybody. Welcome to my podcast, Internetology. Um, this episode, we are going to be talking about infoholism and also how to navigate the digital world. Um, for those who are new around here, my name is Katie Zerman, and I'm a junior at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I am studying psychology and sociology, and this podcast is for an assignment um, for my psychology class called The Psychological Effects of the Internet. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, I recommend watching the uh, introduction episode uh, just to get a bit more information about this about this podcast. Um, and uh, today um, I'm going to start out with an episode overview. So in today's episode, we'll be going over um, what is an infoholic. Um, again, it is not necessarily funny to joke about things like addiction. However, this is a common term that is used by um, individuals on the internet and off the internet. And so I, I'm using that term uh, because for many, it uh, is a common word that's used and is understood. Um, and so I'll be, I'll first be going over what is an infoholic. Uh, the second thing I'll explain um, is how search engines like Google are changing the way that we learn via the internet um, because information can be found with just a few clicks, a few, just one singular Google search. And this has allowed more people to have access to um, the internet and knowledge, or sorry, information on the uh, internet, and um, also has given more people the ability to broadcast uh, information um, via the internet. So then I'm gonna, the next thing I'm gonna be going over are uh, the tips and tricks for navigating the digital world as an infoholic. Um, because I think if, if you're an infoholic, um, it is important to understand that there are, there's lots of information out on the internet, but what, a, what about the internet in, information on the internet is true and what is false and how do you find accurate information in order to be accurately informed? Um, then, uh, the last thing I'll be going over is the importance of digital literacy, um, and its relation to learning via the internet, because having, um, digital literacy and competency is crucial for individuals who seek, um, to obtain information on the internet and also learn via the internet. Um, and within that, I will be going over like why it is important to fact check your information and evaluate the sources from which you're obtaining that information. So the first off, I'm going to start off with what is an infoholic. Um, and I went over this in the introductory episode. Uh, but here, uh, according to Collins Dictionary, this is a submission from 2013. Um, and they defined an infoholic as a person addicted to getting more information, a person addicted to getting more information, especially by way of the internet. So obviously being like an infoholic and the word term addicted to, I think addicted might be like thrown around. I, cause obviously in the DSM, five addiction is uh classified in certain ways and and is characterized by certain uh behaviors um so the term like addicted to getting more information via the internet is not necessarily accurate i would say but somebody who is like constantly seeking for information via the internet and wants to wants to obtain as much information that they can from the internet I think is a more accurate term 
And it's important to note too that being an infoholic is not a bad thing um, because being naturally curious and motivated to learn is honestly a really great trait and great characteristic to have. Um, however, it is like important for um, people who have those characteristics to consider the sources that they're obtaining that information from um, and also whether or not that information is accurate because you can you can know a lot of information but it'll only do you good if that information comes from a reliable source or that information is accurate to reality if that makes sense um so again this is why if you are an infoholic who loves learning and loves obtaining information via the internet um i am going to go over like why why it's important to make sure that you're learning like the correct thing um because kind of going into the question of which this podcast is seeking to answer which is um how the internet is changing the way we learn the internet has brought upon new um new potential for i guess like negative, I don't know how exactly to say it, but it's not good to, the internet has changed the way that people have to like consider their information because I think before misinformation did exist, but the internet has so much more information, like has like, substi- ugh, has significantly more, or uh, like a significant, yeah, more uh, information that is considered like incorrect or is could be considered misinformation because it's so easy to broadcast that information on the internet. And so, like I was saying before, it's so important to like know that and know that how the internet has changed the way we learn because of all the information now we have to learn, people have to learn skills on how to decipher that information that's given to them via the internet. and how to accurately use and i'm sorry how to accurately utilize that information to better their own learning um so yes that is what infoholic is um the next question well the question one of the questions i wanted to answer in today's podcast was how do people find information on the internet um because as i was saying before learning via the internet is like a very easy thing to do um and as i was saying here nowadays it's extremely easy to find information with just a single google search and google and other search engines have had large implications for shaping this and changing the way that we learn via the internet because we because they offer so much information and so like i was saying we need to understand how these things go hand in hand when it comes to learning. Um, And I just thought I would share some Google search statistics um, with you um, because this is kind of showing how how often and how, how much like Google is actually being used by others, like to learn, to find information, to obtain information, et cetera. So, um, first off, Google is um, visited the site eight point nine, or sorry, eight nine, eighty nine point three billion times every single month. Um, and if you think about it, that's pretty insane, because how many people? use Google like every single day. I'll get to that later, but 80, 89.3 billion people a month is also pretty insane. So there's so many people using Google constantly. Um, here, um, here they found that Google like has 8.5 billion searches per day. So every single day 8.5 google searches are being sent out and processed and people are learning via those 
1.5 billion Google searches every single day. And that's just also insane to me because like I said before, how people, so many people are using the internet to obtain the information. And so how many people out of that 8.5 billion actually know how to utilize the info, sorry, utilize the internet in ways that actually benefit their learning and how many eight, how many out of the 8.5 billion Google searches bring up actual accurate results. And these are some things to consider in like when I talk about in the future, so keep them in your mind for now, but think about this is out of all those 8.5 billion Google searches, how many of those searches come up with accurate results and how many of the people who are engaging in those 8.5 billion searches understand how to dissect that information. Um, so yeah, then um, I, I think that it's also kind of crazy and it's also something to consider <clears throat> because even at your fingertips, you can access all this information via your cell phone, um, which just there it just increases the amount again of how much information can you actually obtain via the internet and how much information can you learn via the internet. Um, so, according to this, sixty three percent of Google's U.S. searches are from mobile device devices. So 63% of people Googling or putting like a search question comes from a cell phone. And so once again, consider the fact that uh, like 63% are just coming from your cell phone and how e easily accessible all this information is just at the tips of your fingertips or within the reach of your fingertips. Some expression goes like that. Um, then, um, here, um, they did a survey and they found that 84% of the people who responded to the survey used Google three times a day or more. So that's kind of crazy. Um, I personally think I use Google more than that, but I could be wrong. I don't know. But even three times a day, three times a day, you have access um, to all this information and you're obtaining and learning all this information three times a day. Um, and maybe even more. So that's uh, another thing that's kind of like something that we should consider. Um, so, yes. Um, now, um, now I'm going to discuss an article that discusses how, um, individuals within the scientific research realm, um, how they use Google to find information. Um, because I think, as I was saying to um, Google is one of the places where you can learn information like super quickly and showing that even like individuals who are involved in the realm of scientific research and a academia, they are still using Google to find information. And once again, do these individuals have digital literacy when they are doing these Google searches and how, how, uh, how do we make sure of this? Um, how do we make sure that these individuals who are publishing these articles that are changing the way like of so many, it, paving the way of so many different fields, um, how do you know? Um, and so the first thing I wanted to go over was the uh, methodology of the study. So um, they used a mixed methods. Um, um, and they use, also used um, an original study. 
but they um, focused more on uh, physicists and astronomers, which is where they obtained their data from. No other um, scientific researchers um, or scientists were uh, within the participant group. So um, I just think that's like something to consider because this only took from physicists and astronomers and not not a like a not a not a wide like range of scientists with like different careers um but yes um then um i wanted to find here here so in overall i'm going to dive deep more into this article but in long story short uh google is the tool most used for problem specific information seeking um i'll get more into that later um and also that scientists are growing a resilience um, on general search engines, um, especially Google, to find scholarly articles. Um, and yeah, um, so yes, I guess they m more so though the positive is that more scientists are um, being able to have <clears throat> more awareness about the quantity of papers out on the internet and so they are increasingly relying on the internet to find those articles if that makes sense um so i'm just gonna go to the findings here and i'm going to look for um i'm going to look for the words that I here. Okay. So um this gets more into the problem specific information seeking behavior. Um so in the study um in the study they put them into two different categories. Um, based on the type of information that they were seeking or they sought. Yeah. Um, so the first was unspecified information on a specific subject. Uh, participants looked for general information on a particular topic. Um, for example, looking for scholarly papers on a theory to gather background information in order to prepare for a presentation. Um, so... Um, out of the 88 events, 56 or 64% were in this type and 22 ended with success. So 22 people were able to successfully find the information that they were seeking. The second um, was specific information items. And in this case, they already knew what piece of information they were looking for. Um, and for example, this information is um, like a bibliographic information that ensures a reference at the end of the paper is written correctly um, or definition of a word or expression. So basically like little things like how do you spell a word or is my APA 7th edition citation correct? Things like that. Um, and so out of all those things, 36% uh, out of eight, the 88 uh, events, 36% were of specific information item type. And out of the 32 cases, 87.5% um, of them, um, what, wait, out of, oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. So 
out of those 32 cases, 28 ended with success, which means that 87.5% of those 32 percent or there's 32 cases were successful in finding that information so yeah um and i believe here so here it is is uh, the study reveals the increasing use of Google by scientists for finding uh, scholarly articles. They showed that they do not intentionally use Google to search for articles, although this seems to be changing as more become aware of the inclusion of scholarly articles in Google searches. Um, and um, so it also demonstrated the importance of Google and scholars problem specific information seeking behavior. So long story short, um, the scientists were able to find um, or there's an increase in the utilization of Google in the realm of scientific research um, and that Google is very, <clears throat> very involved in the <clears throat> importance of that problem seeking behavior. So Google plays a very important role in, in helping them find these specific things that they're looking for, or these broad things that they're looking for, in regards to their information seeking behavior. Um, and in fact, too, they talk about Google Scholar. I um, I actually use Google Scholar a lot. Um, I think it's very helpful and it's a very good um, resource to have, especially if you're looking for mainly scholarly articles. Um, I think if you want to utilize information that has a scientific basis and has scientific validity to it, I definitely recommend using Google Scholar to find these this information. Um, I use Google Scholar to find this information even. So um, yes, definitely recommend using Google Scholar. It is a very good resource. Um, and again, if you're interested in looking more into this information, uh, I always leave these articles in the description below. So you are more than welcome to um, investigate these things yourself. Uh, no problem with me at all. <laughs> uh, sorry. Next, I'm going to, I needed my inhaler. Um, so I apologize if my breathiness was annoying to listen to, <laughs> uh, but yes. So, the next thing I'm going to go into is the article I'm going to look into is, is Google making us stupid. Um, and I personally really wanted to just include this article because, um, I thought that the title was kind of eye catching. So yeah, I, I thought it was interesting, but I also wanted to include this article because I think that it really talks about it it's kind of like a piece though that's written in the sense like that it's people are scared people are like worried that it's gonna make people like all of us stupid for using google um and i think this relates to like learning because this person i think doesn't necessarily acknowledge the fact that you can still learn even if you are looking things up on google um i think even if you're looking things up on google you're still in some way learning about that information um and unless you're like looking for like answers to like questions but if you're asking a question then 
you know, there's many ways that you can use Google to find that answer instead of just giving you the answer. Instead, you can actually engage in like a learning process. Um, so yeah, I don't know. This article though, just looks really, really like cool. Um, and so I'm, hmm. What is wrong with this article? Um, hmm. That's weird because I had access to it before. Um, give me one moment and I'm gonna see if I can look for this information using a, my uh, UW Madison's digital library instead, because I think this link was not the link I used originally. So I'll be right back. Alrighty, so now I have the article up. Um, so I apologize for all this technological stuff in my asthma. Um, so. The first thing I wanted to look at was um, one of these statements. Um, here we are. So here the author says, when we read online, or sorry, not the author, but uh, Marion Wolf. When we read online, she says, we tend to become mere decoders of information. Our ability to interpret text, to make the rich mental connections that form when we read deeply and without distraction remains largely disengaged. Um, so kind of like going against of what I was saying earlier, um, uh, Marion Wolf is saying that this actually doesn't happen. Um, when we read off the internet. Um, and I would like to, I'm wondering though, like what exactly, what exactly type of reading? Because yes, you can read a variety of different things on the internet. So it doesn't necessarily have to be it doesn't, it won't, it wouldn't necessarily be a scientific journal, uh, like I'm reading right now, or journal article, yeah. Um, it could be like a, a Instagram or Facebook post. Um, so I think I, I, I would like to, I don't know. I think that it depends on the type of literature you're reading online. Um, but I digress. Um, yes. So yes, that's one of the things I wanted to, to say. Um, the next is this part here. Reading explains Wolf <clears throat> is not an instinctive scale for human beings. It is not etched in our genes the way we speak, the way speech is. We have to teach our minds how to translate the symbolic characters we see into in, to the language we understand. Um, in the media or other technologies we use in learning and practicing the craft of reading play an important part in shaping the neural circuits inside our brains. Um, so, yeah, they continue that the experiments demonstrate that readers of ideograms um, develop a mental circuitry for reading that is very different from the circuitry found in those of us whose written language employs an alphabet. Um, so I guess this is a saying that uh, reading is different when it comes to the 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 written words um if that makes sense it's not the same as like language obviously though that makes sense 
Um, written language is a symbol. So I digress. So then, um, where is it? There is more that I wanted to see. I guess, yeah, that's, I guess that's the only thing I wanted to point out about that. Um, but I guess I can continue more. The variations extend across many regions of the brain, including those that govern such essential cognitive functions, such as memory and the interpretation of visual and auditory stimuli. So, nice. Um... The next page, I believe. Um, hmm. <laughs> I apologize that I wrote down the wrong page numbers, perhaps, but actually no i found it okay the internet an immeasurably powerful computing system is subsuming most of our other intellectual technologies it is becoming our map and our clock our printing press and our typewriter our calculator and our telephone and our radio and tv um and uh, the internet promises to have particularly far-fetching effects on our cognition. Um, so their argument is that the internet has been has changed the way that we cognit our cognitive functioning um, and has become an extension of our our intellectual abilities and our and we have like a strong reliance on it for these cognitive functions that we we possess um and then uh here the result of those things occurring is to scatter our attention and diffuse our concentration um so here is what they were saying about the internet and learning and basically they're saying that the internet this is what i'm per interpreting from the article so um that they're saying that the internet has we have become so reliant on the internet that we are diminishing our own intellectual and cognitive ability uh that's kind of what i'm assuming and and then, and then that has further consequences for our ability to learn and engage with the world and um, pay attention to things and concentrate on the things around us. Um, so yeah, uh, that was that article here. Um, so I guess this article is saying, yeah, Google is making us stupid. Uh, that's, uh, that's what that article is saying. Um, the next article I wanted to go over is how is Google changing our brain or your brain? Um, and this, this is like a, it was in journal, but it, it has a nice like infographics and I think they did a really great job. Um, so there was just one part of this article that I was interested in showing. Um, so here they say that the information, oh, the information retrieved from the internet now arrives sometimes more quickly than what we pull out of our own memories. The little backstory on this article, they're arguing that Google has change the way our our we remember we we memorize things like me remember things about our own lives um remember things about the world around us google has changed that about us um and about our minds um <clears throat> and so 
they are discussing that I that our ability to remember things about our own lives and the world around us and history, things like that are all being being uh, altered by the use of Google. Um, and then one interesting thing I wanted to look at or like show is that they also did, they also measured cognitive self-esteem um, which I'm assuming just means like somebody's self-esteem in regards to their cognitive abilities. Um, so they said here that cognit cognitive self-esteem was significantly higher for those who had just used the internet to search for answers. Um, and e incredibly, even though answers came verbatim from a website, people in the study had the illusion that their own mental capacities had produced this information, not Google. To ensure that people had not felt smarter simply because they were able to answer more questions with the assistance of Google, we followed with a similar study in which those who did not use a search engine received false feedback that they had given the right answers to almost all the trivia questions. Even when participants in both groups believed that they had performed equally well, those who had used the internet reported feeling smarter. Um, so again, this is just really funny to me kind of because, I don't know, I feel like it's just kind of funny if that people think they're smarter when they use the internet to answer your questions instead of their own mental capacities. I don't know. This is just kind of entertaining. Um, but it makes you think too, of then if you use Google to like, like, let's say you are writing a paper and you are, you, you take like this huge chunk out of this article that was already written and you put it into your paper and you cite it correctly and all that is that person more likely to like have more cognitive self-esteem or a higher cognitive self-esteem uh, like because they were like if they get a good grade on that paper then they're like, oh, yes, I wrote a really great paper, even though let's say they use like so many quotes. Of course, I don't think you would ever get a good grade on a paper if the majority of your paper was cited information um, instead of including your own uh, reflection and discussion about it. But I digress. If you if you were to get a good grade on that paper, which would probably hopefully never happen, um, that person probably would think, oh, I'm, I'm so smart. I, I got an A on this paper and my paper was really good, even though they didn't really write any of the paper. Well, they wrote parts of it, but majority of the content that they actually used. <sighs> I don't know. I just thought that was really kind of funny. Um, and I think this also goes into like learning too, because I think they're, I think though learning from the internet, this is just a hypothesis or like a yeah this is a hypothesis of mine but do people think they learned more if they use the internet to look things like up and then they have to write a paper versus then too though then you would have somebody <clears throat> you would have somebody then uh have the same resources you would have to control for that if you had like the same if you could have somebody look at google and have like the same like information come up for those who used google to find the information and then those who didn't use google and instead like had to physically read like something and then you would have somebody physically read like an article let's say and then they would have to write like something about it and then what would be the differences between those two groups? That's just something I'm thinking about. Um, that's a hypothesis. Feel free to indulge in that question.
or a hypo hypothetical question. Uh, I just think that's pretty interesting. Um, anyways, uh, the next thing <laughs> that I'm going to be going over are the potential risks of being an algo, uh, sorry, an infoholic, uh, the potential risk of being an infoholic. And so, um, when you are an infoholic, there are obviously plenty of risks, um, that come with using the information to, to quench your thirst for knowledge and information and learning. Um, and so <clears throat> these are a few articles that um, were shared via this course. Um, and then I also though included more information about stuff, but I'm just gonna go over some of them. Uh, so this was in unit five. Uh, which was broadcasting via um, the internet. And so first I'm looking at one one article which was written by BuzzFeed, which which I'm just saying uh, BuzzFeed is, I don't know if that's the best um, source, but it was used in this course. So I'm going to use it in this podcast. Um, so long story short, 75% of American adults who were familiar with a fake news headline viewed the story as accurate. So basically 75 American, 75, sorry, percent of American adults who were familiarized to fake news headlines still when, when, when shown a fake news headline, they still viewed the story as accurate. Um, and then, where is it? Um, I feel like it's, yeah. Okay. So, these, like, results are saying that it paints a picture of news consumers with little ability to evaluate the headlines that often fly towards them with no context on social media platforms. They also surprisingly suggest that consumers are likely to believe even false stories that don't fit their ideological bias. Um, <clears throat> so there's another thing here is like the analysis that they used, which I don't know, but anyways, um, respondents who said they recalled the story in question uh, were then asked to rate the claim in the headline as very accurate, somewhat accurate, not very accurate, and or not accurate at all. Um, real news headlines received an overall higher accuracy rating than fake news. Um, Um, seventy-five percent of the time, they thought those headlines, um, which were fake news headlines, were somewhat or very accurate. By comparison, they judged eighty-three percent of the real news headlines to be accurate. So this kind of is is kind of painting an interesting picture here because eighty-three percent of the time, people are getting the real news headlines accurately labeled and 75% of the time they're inaccurately labeling the fake news headlines as real news headlines. So people are both good at understanding what a real news headline is, but they're also really bad at understanding what a fake news headline is. But also too, this seems kind of interesting because what if people just have like a bias towards like news articles and then they like, they're like, oh, this is accurate because it's in the news. And that's why there's like so much high percentage of people just saying that it's accurate because people just automatically believe it. 
Um, uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. That's just a question, I guess. That's just a question to think about. Um, the next um, article I wanted to look over was checking what students know about checking the news. And in this study, they took a sample of students who took the ACT test um, and were invited to participate in a survey. Um, the students were asked to evaluate their awareness and the accuracy of a number of online primary and secondary news sources and to identify the types of activities they took to evaluate the accuracy of the sources. <clears throat> a total of 4,072 students responded to at least 80% of the survey items. So out of all the students that were sampled, that amount of that amount of students responded to the entire T. Oh, sorry, responded to at least 80% of the survey questions. Um, so here's what they say. They said that approximately half of the students identified sources that are often classified as misleading, <clears throat> such as US Uncut and The Blaze as accurate. Similarly, 39% reported InfoWars, a website routinely or cited as containing misinformation as accurate. So the students, 51% of the time, classified the US Uncut as accurate, and 46% of the time um, classified the Blaze as as accurate and then 39 percent reported infowars which i'm pretty sure i think i know what infowars is and that's pretty pretty interesting um but yeah so 50 about 50 percent approximately 50 percent half the students so if you think of it this way there's people on one side of the distribution, the normal distribution, who can accurately label these new sources. And then there's people on the other side of the normal distribution. <clears throat> so how do you make that distribution be better for people who look into the news or students especially? Um, and then their recommendations for this information is that um, schools and districts develop courses that teach students how to differentiate between accurate, reliable information and inaccurate, unreliable information. And something in my high school, my high school actually did this. Um, they actually, actually, no, I'm pretty sure I even did it in middle school, probably. I don't really remember. But in my high school, at least, I do remember that we had a whole, like, not a whole unit, but we, we were taught the basics on what information is accurate and what is not accurate. Like, if you are not using a .com, .org, or .edu, maybe be a little suspicious of the information you're looking at. Um, and that was kind of the only thing I remember though. Of course, I know a few other things like I just personally always like to utilize scholarly articles for information because I know that they go through the peer review process and they have scientific evidence to like back up those claims. Um, so, yeah, that's just kind of interesting anyway. So this is basically telling us, though, that people are really bad at deciphering what is right information and what is wrong information, uh, which is a little concerning, um, just a little bit. <laughs> uh, next, um... We're going to look at the Stanford Digital Literacy Study, 
and this study was called Why Students Can't Google Their Way to the Truth, which is also just a fun title. These titles are just super fun. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons why they can't do that is because the site's placement in the search results and students seem to ignore the sponsoring organization and the authors or sorry the article's author and blindly distrust the search engine to pull up the most reliable results first i definitely think this is a very common phenomenon because you like depending on the question how long how, how much time do you want to be spending looking for a reliable accurate like guaranteed source um if you're just trying if you get into like an argument with your friend about something and you're like you're wrong and then you pull up your phone and you google a question you're not gonna be like okay hold on wait i need to find a reliable source okay um no that one's not yeah i don't think that's gonna happen so uh yeah i do definitely can see this i i can definitely see this happening um another one was that um students don't like fact check or sorry no so the people who do fact check so this is like the reason why i'm sharing this article is because <clears throat> i'm going to talk more about this later but fact checking your information is extremely important and so being able to find evidence for one of the claims that you're looking into so here they say um landing on an unfamiliar site the first thing that fact checkers did was to leave it if undergraduates read vertically evaluating online articles as if they were printed news stories fact checkers read laterally jumping off the original page opening up a new tab googling the name of the organization or its president i'm assuming of who published the article is what i'm thinking that they did um so that's like a one one thing that is important to consider um is that instead of just solely relying on one bit of information from one side read laterally and look at other information that's on other sites and or even look for evidence to why the article that you read would be either accurate or inaccurate um the second was fact checkers look past the order of t search results so um instead of just trusting google like to just bring up the most like accurate site they they looked at the urls and the abstracts for clues on what the article was about um and they regularly scrolled to the bottom of the search page in their quest to make an informed decision about where to click first. Um, <clears throat> and so in the end though, the most important thing is that these tips and tricks are not necessarily taught in schools. They're not taught to people. They, people are not being, having how to use the internet explained to them. Um, and so you have so many people who 8.5, what, billion people a day are looking up stuff on Google. Um, or sorry, there's 8.5 billion searches a day on Google. And so out of 8.5 of those billion searches, how many people are just looking at the first thing that pops up on their, on their Google search? Or how many people click on a site and don't fact check? their information. That is a severe disadvantage to being an infoholic, especially if you're an infoholic who doesn't have those skills, then what are you doing to make sure that that information you're learning um, is accurate? And if I guess, you know, 
maybe this is just me. I consider myself like an infoholic, <clears throat> but I definitely think that I do my fact checking because I don't just click on one article and read one. I'm like, oh, that was good enough because I just feel like there's this ever, there's this never like ending quench or sorry, this and never ending like thirst for um, wanting to learn more. So even if I find one article <clears throat> and I read it, I'm like, no, I, I want to learn even more. So then I'll go and I'll, I'll, I'll look up something else or I'll, sorry, I'll look up the same thing, but look at a different like article. Um, and then I'll read that one. And then I'm like, oh, and then this article will lead me to another article. And then I can read that article. And then I just continue to learn and learn and learn more information that is either related to the original thing I was interested in, but also expands upon that. The next article I would like to say or to speak about is, well, the next like topic I want to discuss is how do you be how, continuing our discussion about how to be a reliable or be an accurately informed infoholic. That's basically what I'm asking, like, or I'm not asking, but I'm, I'm giving some tips on how to be an accurately informed infoholic. So the first is um, having digital literacy. And for those who are not, um, not sure what that term means, um, I found this article I wasn't able to get access to the article through the UW Madison Library, but here they define what digital literacy is <clears throat> in the abstract. Digital literacy involves any number of digital reading and writing techniques across multiple media platforms. These media include words, text, visual displays, motor graphics or motion graphics, audio, video, and multimodal forms. There are a myriad cognitive processes at play, along with a continuum from consumption to production when a reader is immersed with digital content, content as well as print text. Um, so that's kind of in their abstract. Here, the, the authors of the article have divided the various intellectual processes associated with digital literacy into three categories. <clears throat> Locating and consuming digital content, creating digital content, and communicating digital content. Learners must develop evaluative dispositions um, as they navigate the digital content. A discerning mindset is essential in, in order to interact with online digital resources with accuracy. Without critical evaluation, the learner may be easily directed by the technology rather than the learning, or sorry, the learner directing the inquiry. So in essence, digital literacy is locating and consuming the content, using the content to create additional digital content and or uh, creating the digital content and then also their ability to communicate the digital content. And here they highlight that learners must be critical of these, of the content that they are consuming and that um, it is essential in order to interact with them with accuracy. So that's in essence what, um, digital literacy is. Um, again, here is an article from, um, from the uh, psychology course I'm taking, also from Unit 5. And it's called The Honest Truth About Fake News and How Not to Fall for It. So under the Impressionable Young Minds section, they uh, divulge into, I don't know if I said that word right, but I digress, um, the Stanford's History Education Group study. Um, and they collected nearly 8,000 responses from middle school, high school, and college students um, around the country who were asked to evaluate online information presented in tweets, comments, and articles. Um, 
So they said, overall, young people's ability to reason with the information on the internet can be summed up in one word, bleak, which is depressing. Um, here they said that um, more than 80% of middle schoolers in the study believed that native, native or naive, I digress, ads um, <clears throat> resembling articles were actually real news stories, even though they were labeled as sponsored content. Um, high school students were asked to evaluate a post from a popular image sharing site featuring a picture of unusually deformed daisies titled Fukushima nuclear flowers. Not much more to say. This is what happens when flowers get nuclear birth defects. Despite the complete lack of attribution, attribution, attribute, whatever, um, or evidence, most students accepted the picture at face value. So they were shown pictures of deformed daisies. And then they were said that, oh, these daisies are deformed because of like nuclear, uh, what's the word, like nuclear radiation. Um, and didn't even ask a question about it because there's this like, all these things that could make the daisy deformed, but they were like, oh yeah, okay, that's that's because of nuclear fallout, yeah, okay. Um, here they continue. They didn't ask where it came from. They didn't verify it. They simply accepted the picture as fact. Uh, so that's a little concerning. Um, and then they said, oh, Many of the high schoolers in the study also couldn't tell the difference between real and fake news sources in their Facebook feed. Uh, meanwhile, most college students in the study didn't suspect any kind of bias in a tweet from a left-leaning activist group that cited a public opinion survey on gun ownership and background checks. Uh, so again, it's uh, kind of scary that people can easily fall for this information. And again, it's a risk when it comes to learning over the internet because <clears throat> you have to be critically, you have to critically analyze these information and, and, and make sure that it's accurate. Um, otherwise, it's, uh, it's uh, not very good for you. Um, if you're an infoholic or just somebody who uses the internet. Um, here, is um, an infographic uh, that they shared too in this article. So fake, and it's fake news edition, big red flags for fake news, all caps or obviously Photoshop pictures, a glut of pop-ups and banner ads, good sign the story is pure clickbait. Check the domain. Fake sites often add .co to trusted brands to steal their luster. If you land on an unknown site, check its about page, then Google it with the word fake and see what comes up with it. If a story offers links, follow them. No links, no quotes or references, another telltale sign. Verify an unlikely story by finding a reputable, reputable outlet reporting the same thing. Check the date. Uh, read past the headlines. Often they bear no resemblance to what lies beneath. Photos may be misidentified and dated. Use a reverse image search engine uh, to see where the image really comes from. Uh, if a story makes you angry, it's probably designed that way. And finally, if you're not sure it's true, then don't share it. Do not share it. Um, so those are some tips from uh, this article here. Uh, the next are uh, fake or real, how to self-check the news and get the facts. Um, and this was published by uh, National Public Radio. Um, so here, here are some more tips. Pay attention to the domain and URL. Um, doc, for example, ABC 
abcnews.com is a legitimate news source, but abcnews.com.co is not. Um, check the comments. Headlines will often be written in exaggerated language with the intent of being misleading and then attached to stories that are com about a completely different topic or just not true. Uh, reverse image search, we already went over that. But um, two, you can look at the quotes in the, in the article. This was another thing I, I think was like important because I'm thinking of the instance where let's say you have an article that's like says eating carrots are bad and then you look at the article and the highlighted or the sorry the quotes in the article are like they're just kind of seem like they're missing something like they quote just like a few words out of the entirety of what the original article was saying of course you don't know that unless you check the actual original source of the quote but so then you, so this article about eating carrots are bad, you go and you go to the original source of this quote and you find that it was an article that says eating carrots are bad for birds and not humans. But they said that the eating carrots are bad, but the article was about eating carrots are bad for birds. Um, so things like that. I actually don't know if eating carrots are bad for birds. I'm just saying that. So do not take what I'm saying with like that. That was just me having it as an example. Um, but that's just something I've noticed too um, about those things. And finally, um, and publication by Michigan State University. Also currently, um, let take a moment to, to um, think of the students who lost their lives in the recent shooting on their campus. Um, that was very, very disappointing. Um, and I am thinking of those students and also all the students at MSU um, and hope that they will be able to come together as a community and be better and grow more connected and 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 it's just kind of scary too just being a college student um, I digress um, in this article they also had some more tips on how to find accurate information on the internet um, and some of the ways you can find whether or not the information is a credible is is credible is by um, looking at the author um, let's say the author is writing about cer a certain scientific phenomena um make sure that that author has like a phd um because or like is 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 a credible author that is also within that field because you could have somebody who has like a phd in art um and then they're writing an article about like neuroscience and of course, yeah, that's just, that's just not good. So an author writing an informational piece that will have their related credentials listed. Don't be fooled by titles. A person with a PhD can be listed as a doctor, but doesn't mean he or she is an expert in all subjects. The PhD should be in a field related to the topic and the author's current position should be clearly identified. Uh, fact checking, we've already kind of went over it, but um on a website you are unsure of it is good idea to check a uh, spot check facts with a more reputable websites or research papers um and this also goes into bias as well so um it's important to consume unbiased information um because that also isn't necessarily accurate um 
look to see whether or not the website is sponsored. Uh, often website sponsors appear on the sidebars of a website or across the top. And the web address, we've kind of already went over. Oh yes, .gov was another one. Um, so .gov means the website is owned and operated by the government. Website ending in edu is always affiliated with the universities, colleges, and educational sites. Um, uh, website ending in .org was set up for nonprofit organizations. Um, and .com or .net offer scholarly advice um, or sorry, are trying to sell you project, a product. So .com and .net are open to public use. So be iffy about that, but not to. Um, be alert if the website sponsor is for profit, the author's credentials are not related to the topic, and the web address ending has a .com, .net, or .org. Be assured if the article is if the author is qualified to discuss this top subject, the information was retrieved by a qualified person, and the web ending has a .gov or .edu. Um, so, yeah, that is that. Those couple of tips for um, finding a reliable source um, and how to be an accurate <clears throat> and accurately informed infoholic. Um, I want to continue on this path of digital literacy and how it relates to learning and the internet. And I found this really interesting study that examined the digital literacy competencies and learning habits of open and distance learners. And this also, they, the people in the study were utilizing the internet to learn, um, which I just thought was really cool. Um, and so, I need to find uh, here. So this is like a summary of the article here, or sorry, the purpose of the study. The purpose of this study is to examine the digital literacy competencies and learning habits of open and distance learners at Anadolu University. Within this context, the research questions are listed, are listed as follows. What are the abilities of learners to use the digital technologies in digital life? Um, what are the learning habits of the learners? And what are the abilities of the learners in using digital tools for learning purposes? Um, then, in here, they um, also offer sub-disciplines of digital literacy so they have in this article they defined like sub-disciplines of it um and it's kind of like the umbrella the things that are underneath the umbrella of digital literacy so they have information literacy finding and locating sources analyzing and synthesizing the material evaluating the credibility of a source using and citing ethically and legally focusing topics and formulating research questions in an accurate, effective, and efficient manner. Computer literacy, an understanding of how to use computers and application software for practical purposes. Media literacy, a, com a series of communication competencies, including the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and communicate information in a variety of forms, including print and non-print messages. Communi communication literacy. Learners must be able to communicate effectively as individuals and work uh, collaboratively in groups using publishing technologies, um, the internet, as well as other electronic and telecommunication tools. Visual literacy. The ability to read, interpret, and understand information presented in a pictorial or graphic images. The, Im Im the ability to turn information of all types into pictures, graphics, or forms that help communicate the information. Um, a group of competencies that allows humans to discrim discriminate and interpret the, the, vi the visible action objects and or sim symbols, natural or constructed, that they encounter in the environment. And finally, technology literacy. Computer skills and the ability to use computers and other technology to improve learning, productivity, and performance. So yes, 
Um, that is the subdisciplines that they defined in the article. Um, here, um, I wanted to just go over the conclusions of the study and the future recommendations for the study. Um, if you don't have a background in uh, reading scholarly articles, in essence, the conclusion kind of reiterates the findings of the study and also the future directions of the study. So the recommendations are basically what can you do in the future to further further expand upon the research that was done, but also utilize like the research in a real world context. So, um, and so the findings regarding the learning habits were that the participants generally preferred learning through graphics or visuals, through listening and learning, um, and through written materials. Um, a majority of the participants are dependent learners and they face and prefer face-to-face -face education. Um, participants are usually not competitive learners. Um, and that most of the participants consider having problem solving and work project working skills to deal with educational difficulties. Um, so here, <clears throat> sorry, here it is observed that the ratio of using personal computers is high, but the use of the new generation technologies are not common among the learners. This situation may be due to the fact that prices of new generation devices are high. Um, this is more so focused on Anadolu University. Um, but overall, basically the conclusions were that the learners in this study anyway, had a basic understanding on how to use information and in, in, in communication technologies at a basic level. Um, and that training uh, on how to use digital tools more effectively for the purpose of learning is needed. Um, and as McLaughlin stated, there is still training need for learning on digital literacy skills and digital competencies. So in conclusion, the participants in this study possessed basic comprehension of how to utilize information and communication technologies at the basic level, but they needed more training and, um, and more, what's it called? And more support um, in learning digital on how to utilize digital tools for the purposes of learning that is in an effective and beneficial way um, and thereby needing further support in developing those digital literacy skills and digital competencies. Um, so yes, um, here to this article also be in here. So if you're interested in looking at that article too, um, feel free. This um, Yes, so yeah, that was that article there. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and here are three. I for one of the assignments, it was it was for a discussion. Uh, with my uh, group chat for this course, um, and we had to come up with three ways. Uh, or three reasons why college students why college students should be di digitally literate and I kind of I came up with three ideas even though we were supposed to come up with like one idea each well I guess depending on how many group members I had three group members but um regardless I came up with three ways on or three reasons why being digital liter having digital literacy is important 
um, or why being digitally literate is important. I cannot say that word. I can never talk. Oh, well. Anyways, the reasons what I came up with um, were basically the first one was having the ability to analyze information from the internet helps with developing critical thinking skills. Obviously, I think that while you are have a critical eye towards the information you see on the internet, um, I think that also helps develop your critical thinking skills further, regardless of whether or not you have critical thinking skills or you don't. The continuous practicing of it, I think, helps develop it further. <clears throat> So the example I used was if a student comes across inaccurate information on the internet, they need to be capable of deciphering whether or not that information holds true um, by fact checking it with other sources. Um, so the critical thinking skills, critical thinking skills are like when are basically by fact checking something because you have the critical thinking skill of being like, hey, you know, I need to, I need to look into this further. I can't just accept it at face value. Um, the second one was that being digitally literate allows for college students to produce high quality work. Um, so obviously this goes into play, comes into play because when you need to produce a high quality piece of work, um, then it's important to use the information that is accurate and reliable instead of like a, a, an opinion piece. So an example I said was, let's say that you're supposed to write a paper arguing that cats are better than dogs. In order to do this, you'll need to know how to find supporting evidence for your claim that is based on fact instead of fiction. If you write your paper solely on fact instead of or sorry, in solely on fiction instead of fact, I personally don't think that would be considered as high quality work. Um, that's just my personal opinion. I think that information and like facts are crucial for having an argument. And also it's just not necessarily smart of somebody to not rely on information that is based in fact. And fiction too. Fiction can encompass a lot of things. It can can encompass just flat out wrong information, but it and it can also involve misinformation. Um and then finally it can also involve having biased information. Because again, if you're using biased information, that isn't necessarily fact because the bias puts in kind of like imagine it's like a Wisconsin winter it puts like a foot of snow on top of that information regardless if that information is based on fact if it's written in a biased viewpoint or way then it's not necessarily good to use that information um the last thing I said was it's important to know which websites are more likely to contain accurate information compared to websites that are less likely to contain accurate information in regards to learning. Because if you're not using in, if you are using inaccurate information to learn about something, then you're actually not learning the correct thing. So this is another thing, because if you are not using accurate information to support your learning, then then you're not learning the right thing. You're not learning the things that you're supposed to. You might be learning stuff, but it just isn't true. So it's kind of hurting you. It's hurting your like self and it's hurting the people around you if you decide to share that information. And it's also like just flat out dumb, in my opinion. <laughs> it's kind of dumb if you take inaccurate information and then consider it to be correct. I just, I don't know. Um, something, some, sometimes, you know, you can't, you can't uh, say things the nicest way. Um, and that was me doing that now um, by saying that it's dumb. But I think I am 
valid in that statement. So anyways, um, now we're at the point of the episode where I, I do the TLDR, which stands for too long, didn't read. Um, and so in today's episode, I first defined what an infoholic was. And again, being an infoholic is not bad at all. Um, because I think being an infoholic actually is a benefit. Um, and if you possess those characteristics of being a naturally curious person and who is intrinsically motivated to learn, that is really amazing. But on the other hand, you have to have digital literacy and you have to have the ability and the skills to decipher accurate information come from inaccurate information because then that makes you an infoholic who is not in correctly informed. The next thing I talked about was basically how Google and other search engines on the internet are cha shaping and changing the way that we're learning. Um, basically, the ability to just find some piece of information on the internet has significantly changed how we learn it. We learn via the internet. Um, and I discussed the prevalence of how how often and how utilized Google is at um, obtaining information. And then I also discussed um, the perspectives of individuals who said that Google is basically making us stupid um, and it's hurting our ability to learn um, and divulge into uh, the kind of learning process. Um, and then I also discussed um, some findings of that people actually aren't as good as they assume or that we just automatically assume at finding or knowing the difference between fake news and real news and also fake information and real information. Um, and then this has like negative consequences on um, a lot of variety of things, including learning. Um, then I also discussed some tips and tricks on how to be a better learner and by, on via the internet by utilizing digital literacy skills. Um, and then I discussed a little bit about um, digital literacy and what it is, um, and also some findings that they from an from a uh, article that was done on university students who utilized online learning and um basically it stressed the importance that learning digital literacy skills and digital uh competencies is super important when it comes to learning via the internet and in essence it's important to understand that how well it's important to understand how the internet has changed the way we learn um but also too that now that the internet is we can use the internet for learning it's important to consider or it's important to not consider but be be aware of the risks that come along with having using the internet as a tool for learning uh because i think that the internet can be used as an effective tool and it's a great tool for learning but but if you're not able to have if you don't possess the digital literacy skills or have digital competency that is not it's not going to do you any good so um it's important to develop that and before we before in terms of learning before the internet we didn't have to worry about these things necessarily um, when it comes to being exposed to all these types of information constantly and having such easily easy, easy access to it. But now the internet has actually changed that that about uh, and has required us to learn more skills on how to analyze and consume and produce information um from the internet and through the internet um sorry i just need to sorry um 
And then the last thing I discussed was why it's important to be digitally literate um, as a college student, but also these things don't necessarily just apply to college students, but also in general. But um, digital literacy is important because it helps develop critical thinking skills. It helps one produce high quality work. And it also helps you like be assured and know that you're learning the correct thing instead of the incorrect thing and not looking like a damn idiot. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, that's the too long didn't read. Um, and I, again, I appreciate you um, watching this episode. I hope that you were, you learned a lot. Um, and I am looking forward to my next episode, but I, again, I really appreciate you tuning in um, and I will see you next episode. So have a great rest of your day or night um, and remember to be aware and critical of the things you see online, including this video, because who knows, maybe, maybe I'm saying some misinformation, you never know. Uh, so be critical. <laughs> um, I'll see you next time.